Hi there, um, my name is Maveni Kumar and I'm UNRWA USA's communication manager. And I want to first start by paying tribute to the original inhabitants of the land that I now call home, um, the Nakashtank people. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with UNRWA USA's work, we uplift the voices, experiences, and humanity of Palestine refugees to secure American support for resources essential to every human being and for the promise of a better life. Um, in honor for Mental Health Awareness Month and the one year anniversary of George Floyd's murder this past week, today we're hosting an intersectional panel discussion with our lovely mental health experts from various backgrounds um, to talk about the importance of children's mental health, including that of Palestine refugees. While all of our lives have been drastically altered by COVID-19, those coming into the pandemic already facing economic instability, displacement, disruptions to their education and systemic injustices are likely to exit with long-term mental health impacts unless appropriate interventions are provided. So before I introduce our wonderful panelists, I wanted to put you in the shoes of a refugee child in the Gaza Strip. You are just 13 years old. The deadly violence of this past month is not new. You've already survived multiple Israeli military assaults, but you know that many of your classmates, friends, and family members have not. You've seen people lose limbs and have their homes destroyed. You fearfully tried to fall asleep to the sounds of bombs going off and drones flying overhead. You've likely never left the Gaza Strip. You experience PTSD akin to a soldier coming back from war but you're barely a teenager. This is a difficult reality to imagine, but it's the one that most children in Gaza face. And that's why we're counting on all of you to support refugee mental health through UNRWA USA's virtual Gaza 5K and digital festival, which will be held on Saturday, June 12th. After listening to today's panel, you can sign up at gaza5k.org. Now, let us introduce our distinguished guests who will be able to speak more about mental health challenges in their communities and how we can all do our part to support each other's mental health. First, we have Dr. Aaron Sadler, a licensed clinical psychologist at Children's National Hospital. Dr. Sadler specializes in the treatment of anxiety, mood, and trauma slash stress related disorders in youth from infancy to adolescence and during the perinatal period. We also have with us Dr. Nelly El-Ghazel, a Palestinian American child and adolescent psychologist and instructor in the Department of Psychiatry at the Wheel Cornell Medical College. Lastly, but certainly not least, we have Dr. Michael Yellowbird. He is the Dean and Professor of the Faculty of Social Work at the University of Manitoba, a citizen of the Mandan, Hidasta, and Arikara nations. He works with tribal and indigenous peoples to bring mindfulness and neuro decolonization approaches to these communities. We would have wanted to have someone from the Gaza Strip speak as well, but currently they are reeling from the aftermath of another deadly round of hostilities. That and the time difference have made it difficult, but we hope to host something in the future to amplify their voices. I'll first let our guests briefly introduce themselves more deeply and in their own words, beginning with Dr. Sadler, then Dr. Al-Ghazel, and then Dr. Yellowbird. Um, Dr. Sadler, if you don't mind. Happily. Good evening, everyone, slash morning, afternoon, depending on where you are. I am Dr. Erin Sadler. Um, I will only add that um, some of my trauma specialty happens to also land in early childhood. And during my work at Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C., I also get to participate in a multitude of our training programs. So that way we are making sure that our next clinicians that are out in the field are well versed in being able to assess and treat a lot of the uh, mental health conditions that we'll probably talk about today. So thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Dr. Alcuzel. Uh, you're on uh, mute really quickly. <laughs> no worries. Ah, thank you for reminding me. I think, oops, thank you. Now I'm, I'm all systems running. Okay, so um, thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am a trained as a school psychologist, was working um, in Maryland as a licensed uh, psychologist as well, both in private practice and in the schools. And now I work in Doha, Qatar um, at a hospital. And a lot of my work is still focused on um, 
while we do like a lot of broad spectrum stuff at where I work, I, I do a lot of outreach with the schools and really building that infrastructure in terms of helping support the schools um, with mental health training and equipment and equipping. And that's it's just been such an amazing thing to do. Cause I grew up actually in Doha. And so it's really nice to be part of a community um, and work and pour into a community in which I grew up. Fantastic. Um, and Dr. Uh, Yellowbird, if you don't mind uh, finishing us off and adding whatever you might want to. Gosteid, thank you very much. Uh, I'm coming to you from um, uh, Treaty 1 territory in um, Canada, the land of the Anishinaabe, the Dakota, the uh, Métis, the uh, Cree, OJ Cree, and Diné people. Um, I, I'm really glad to be here tonight and to be a part of this panel, this very distinguished and esteemed panel. I, I'm really loving it to hear what people are doing and how people are supporting this cause. Um, I've been involved a bit uh, um, with, uh, with uh, some of this uh, understanding what, what's been happening in Gaza. I've had uh, some friends who are psychiatrists who are over there and students and social work that have worked in, in that part of the world too to try to you know, create peace um, bridges between people. So I'm a bit familiar with the area. Um, I, I'm uh, Mandan, Hiradza, and Rikara. Um, I'm a tribal person from uh, uh, the United States, from the state of North Dakota. And a lot of my work is centered around uh, colonization and decolonization, methods of decolonization. So I, I, I look at large systems of colonization and look at the effects that happen to people when uh, you colonize people's minds, you colonize their bodies, you colonize their movements. And how do we, um, you know, uh, move towards uh, liberation on um, these different kinds of ways of the body and the mind? So uh, I, I do a lot of that through contemplative, as well as traditional indigenous um, practices. So thank you. It's good to be here. Fantastic. Yeah, that's you know highly relevant. Um, you know, not only to the indigenous populations in the U.S., but you know the Palestinian people. So we're really fortunate to have you and all of that insight. Um, so I think first I'd like to sort of, especially for our audience, kind of get a, a baseline set of knowledge, you know, on what childhood trauma is. So, you know, from what age are children affected by um, trauma and how early, you know, mental health disorders like PTSD can start to develop? I was wondering if um, Dr. Sadler or Dr. Al perhaps one of you could start us off um, and you know, giving us an overview a little bit on on what childhood trauma looks like. Happily, I can get us started. Um, when I think actually of early childhood trauma specifically, I actually go back before even conception that children that are born into communities um, may be born into trauma in and of itself. And so for some individuals that we may be working with or wanting to support, they may actually experience trauma in its own shape or way, shape or form, even before they're born. Um, and as an infant mental health specialist, I am able to work with children truly from birth um, or even during that prenatal period where we're trying to do some extra buffers um, in order to prevent some long lasting impacts of traumatic stress or um, traumatic exposures during childhood. I'm happy to give a little description of what it can look like, but feel free if you want to, Dr. Elgazal. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, well, trauma in general we know is, I should actually just stress, move us back to just thinking about stress in general, that stress overall is something that's pretty natural for anyone to experience. In many ways, stress can be really healthy um, you can have kind of positive stress, or if I'm worried about a football game or a soccer game, that that type of stress can help me to even just kind of perform better, that I'm more alert and more thoughtful. Um, but when we start to move into stressors that maybe even just overwhelm our ability to cope, that that's when we're starting to move towards the territory of kind of traumatic stress, where the system, our body systems become kind of overloaded, and we aren't really able to cope in the same way as something that's a little bit more short-term, easy to deal with. And that can certainly happen for children as young as, like I said, from birth. Um, and some of those general symptoms that we might look for when we're thinking about both just traumatic stress, but just general stress responses tend to come into play when we think about that fight or flight 
um, if you probably have heard many times, but fight, flight, or freeze, those types of responses are pretty typical for just general stress. Um, when we are moving towards kind of more of a clinical post-traumatic stress disorder, then we may actually be looking more at um, kind of a longer lasting impact of those fight, flight, or freeze responses and what that looks like in the day-to-day -day for children. In some cases, it may be kind of emotional responses where we see either kind of over-responsivity to uh, more benign things. So things, new adjustments to new schedules or new routines that young children especially may not be able to adjust to that as quickly. Um, and in terms of some of that fright response or flight response, there may be a lot of avoidance of even discussions about traumatic stress. Well, it looks like Dr. Sadler froze. Oh, there we go. Um, okay, great, great. You're great. <laughs> Perfect. A lot of things. But in general, I'll say that stress can look like a lot of different things, um, but our fight, flight, or freeze are what we tend to see most often. Um, but the tricky thing with traumatic stress is that it can be much more long-lasting than our typical everyday stressors, and that's where we start to worry about long-lasting impacts and needing to do some preventative or just general therapeutic support from there. Thank you so much. Actually, one of the first things that you um, had mentioned uh, about being able to create trauma or, you know, people having trauma even before they're born due to the circumstances, it kind of, um, it, it made me think about the situation in Palestine, you know, as children, grandchildren and great grandchildren of the Nakba, um, which is the original displacement in 1948 of Palestine or Palestinians um, from the historic land. Um, they face this intergenerational trauma due to you know that displacement and poverty and you know the instability that's carried down and i'd be curious as to what this looks like in the you know arab black and indigenous communities who face sort of similar um similar but possibly different uh type of uh, intergenerational trauma if um y'all could comment on that I think Dr. Gazelle, you have a value. Yes. Okay. So I think, you know, when we talk about like sort of intergenerational trauma, I think that looks different depending on the exposure of, of, of where within the family you fall and what you've been through. And also, like, we know the Palestinian diaspora is sort of all over the world, right? And so I think it also looks, um, I think people, experience it differently depending on if they have somewhere where they now currently if you live in a country where now you've been naturalized and or you're a citizen of this country versus if you live in a country where um, you're living there as a resident i think the effects of feeling like you don't belong to something there's already the effect that you you, you can't go home right but then to feel like you don't have another safety net just adds kind of another layer to that you know and then like just like we talk about for um, a variety of, um, of when we look at like transitions, there is, there is the idea of like initially being displaced, then resettling, then acculturating, then feeling like you're not connecting with people, right? And so we look at those different things as well as, as how they would impact. Um, and obviously if your parents were the ones that moved and you were born somewhere else, then you may not have had the, the sort of displacement and the, and the resettling, but you may still kind of be in that sort of acculturation stress. Uh, Dr. Sather, Dr. Yellowbird, do you, do you have any understanding of how it might affect um, the communities that you all work with? Yeah. <clears throat> are you asking me a question or are you just? Okay. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, if you, I don't know if you're still kind of going in a circle, kind of answering or if we're going back and forth. So, uh, yeah. I, um, I'd love to keep it as kind of a conversation, you know, just to keep it less, uh, less, less formal. Yeah, um, you know, sure. and, and also for people who are watching, if you want to uh, put comments of some questions that you may have, um, you're welcome to do so. So we can field them to our panelists as well. But please continue. Yeah. So, so I think, you know, like with most populations, at, at one point, it's hard to disentangle, you know, um, 
uh, us from you know, one another uh, when you think about evolutionary uh, biology. Um, and I use a lot of evolutionary biology in my work, and I go back and think, you know, humans, we really evolved to have a number of fears. We evolved, you know, uh, negativity was one of our saving graces, and to mistrust and to be suspicious. Um, it's, all, it's all part of our, who we are as, as human beings. Um, you know, that's, that's our nature. And, um, and when I look at indigenous people, um, you know, I can see a lot of that in, in stories. There's a lot of traditional stories people talk about. It uh, doesn't matter what culture you're from. They talk about monsters and talk about things that will eat you or, or uh, storms. So there's these different kinds of things that exist in the natural world, right? And, and so we, we've, we've got that already built into our, our, into our uh, genetic, you know, cultural, our, our cultural uh, culture and in, in, in our genes kind of co-evolved together when you look at uh, cultural neuroscience. It's really interesting to look at that. And you see that there are different kinds of protective factors for that. For instance, um, one of the big protective factors for indigenous people around the world is humor. You know, uh, to laugh at, you know, death, to laugh at pain, to laugh at tragedy, those kinds of things. It's not something people do much in the Western world. And um, in, interestingly enough, um, when people laugh at things that maybe people think it's inappropriate, it's not really them laughing per se, it's actually genes expressing, right? People say, well, we laugh to feel more comfortable, but there's actually uh, particular genes that express for that, one called the serotonin transporter gene, which is uh, interesting, uh, which has an interesting uh, effect because it also codes for collectivity, for collectiveness. So it's got dual, it's, you know, genes have dual roles, all kinds of roles. So when I look at indigenous people, I think this is how many of us have uh, um, survived uh, calamity and uh, catastrophe was by grouping together and collective, collective being, being together, you know, through prayer, through song, through dance, through uh, belief in a higher power, which again has kind of saved us from a lot of things, however you believe that power to be. And uh, I see that in indigenous cultures, you know, um, having the same kind of thread and elements. So when you get back to trauma, uh, not only does it start before, you know, people are born, but it starts many, many generations back, you know, and uh, some of the signs of that now and some of the work that I've done is looking at um, what happens to telomeres, you know, the uh, caps on the end of a chromosome. And I've had my mother's analyzed, I've had mine analyzed and other people's analyzed and to look at, you know, whether or not people have had very stressful, traumatically stressful lives. And um, it's, there's a clear pattern to it that um, moms, when they're not safe, when they when they feel threatened, when uh, times are difficult, and uh, you know when that when the conditions are all wrong for them, will produce uh, will shorten their telomeres, which will actually pass on to babies. So babies are born born biologically older. You know this is new research; people don't understand that already. So that's happening a lot now. If you were to go in and test kids in the Gaza, you would probably good chance to find you they have shortened telomeres, which of course then means shortened telomeres at the end of the chromosomes means that they're either gonna get the diseases of aging earlier, heart disease, cancers, uh, tumors, obesity, you know, all these different kinds of things. And um, so it's, you know, it's, it's really a crime against humanity. It's a crime against humanity to expose people to that kind of um, treatment. You know, whether or, not, whether or not you're bombing someone you know, but when you uh, or or you're you know um, brutalizing them, even the the fear, even even the being controlled your movements, control thinking, these are all things that are going to not only cause chronic stress but they're going to shorten your telomeres. So you know I've written about this topic. It's about what I call the uh, the, um, the the colonization of of uh, or molecular colonization, how your body can be colonized at a molecular level. That happens to all people who have been oppressed. Uh, around the world, when I think about indigenous people, it's, it's pretty clear you see that kind of thing. We don't see those molecular sort of uh, colonizations happen unless we, t we take a really deep look. And so now today we have that technology, but we can see everything else. We can see the aging, we can see the chronic di diseases and disorders, the suicide, we can you know write down on charts about how people are, are you know, psychologically you know, um, uh, affected and, and you know, disrupted. But now we were able to get down to that molecular level and the cellular level to kind of, and, and even to the epigenetic level to say, wow, you know, 
this certainly is something that continues on and on. So even when the war, let's say the war ends in the Gaza, you know, by some miracle it ends, and people are given their land and there's a two state or whatever happens, but the people are not under that constant threat. That kind of thing is going to continue on in the, in the, in the molecular structures of people, and they're going to carry that for generations. So, you know, we're never truly done with that. We inherited that. The body responds to that, and it's a protective factor. keeps us on alert. And um, like Dr. Uh, Sadler was saying, it, it's, 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 you know, people develop sensitivities for a reason. It's a survival mechanism. You'll find that when you, when you take a sample of, of um, some of these folks and look at their DNA, you're going to find out a lot of them are carriers of a particular gene called ADRA2B. ADRA2B is a is gene that, that codes for emotionally enhanced vividness so that you can see the trauma and you can see the blood and you can see the destruction over and over again, right? Those people are storytellers. They're messengers. But they're very fragile, too. It's what they also call... Um, um, Dan, or they call tulip children. Dandelion kids have a different kind of genetic um, predisposition and they can walk through fire, they can walk through war much easier. But it's never easy. Yeah. So that's what I see like in my work that I've done when I start looking at you know, indigenous people and I start to see those genetic lines coming down. And then I say, oh, now I understand why life expectancy is so long, low among um, uh, Native American Indians in the, in the United States or indigenous people in the United States or Canada, right? I know why they're very low among Aboriginal people in Australia, right, or in Africa that have been subjected to generations and generations of, of trauma. And, and part of that, you know, um, this last thing I say, I know because I know I'm taking up a lot of time. The last thing I'll say is that, you know, there, was, there were all these different kinds of um, 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 papal bulls that were passed by the, the Catholic Church that started you know, uh, collecting slaves that gave uh, European states, you know, uh, the right to go in and encroach upon um, people's lands to, to, for the church, right? Or to, uh, to uh, get slaves from Africa or come to, to the North America, you know, to uh, the doctrine of discovery. So those things are not, it's not just an isolated incident here. It's been happening for, for hundreds and hundreds of years and then go back thousands of years where we've been subjected to the natural kinds of calamities and catastrophes. So you can imagine how you know, different we may look you know, if we didn't have that. So I think, again, just getting back, I think that's something you'll see when you start looking at those populations of children. So, Dr. Sattler, I saw you nodding um, a lot during uh, you know, Dr. Yellowbird's uh, comments, and I was wondering if you wanted to add anything onto that because it seemed like you know, you've either seen or maybe even experienced um, this through your work as well. Most certainly. Um, and I say I've, I'm always amazed at what we're learning more from the molecular level because I think we have a lot of research that just gives us more kind of direct facts. I go back to our the ACEs study. So I'm thinking about adverse childhood experiences and that study back in the early 90s and thinking about how true adverse childhood experiences, whether it's abuse, neglect, just being in a home environment where someone in the home has a mental illness or experiencing um, pretty significant loss. So maybe the death of a family member or separation from a family member, how those experiences themselves have implications for life expectancy even, um, where if we're hitting upwards of maybe three or four of those ACEs at a time, what we found is that there was even a 20 year difference in life expectancy. And so if we are able to get down to the molecular level um, and really get a lot of that research out, it will be, I think, really, really groundbreaking. Um, but and the work that I do now, it's really being able to get a good assessment of what the children that I get to see are coming into the office with. And so I'm located in Washington, D.C., and so I get to work with families from across the DMV. Um, so a pretty wide range of both SES, um, racial ethnic makeup across the board. And there are distinct differences for populations that have had pretty longstanding histories of oppression um, racism and how the truly even what families are presenting with and coming into the office with and what we're having to manage and then try to both tolerate and find interventions for can look very different because we're working with a lot. Um, it is a lot. So I just appreciate all of the input. <laughs> and so thank you both Dr. Yellowbird and El Gazal too.
Yeah, it's, it, you know, the last thing that you mentioned in terms of some of the symptoms that you're seeing, um, you know, in, in these communities, I'd be curious to hear also, what are the poor, what are the signs of poor mental health? Um, because I'm, I'm assuming also, we're probably seeing this among even our friends or, you know, we, if we know people, especially, you know, with COVID-19 this past year, you know, all of us have, you know, experienced some sort of decline probably in our, in our mental health. And I'd be curious, like, what are, what are the signs of, of poor mental health and how do we see it? I mean, I, the, the laughing was really interesting. I think about the, the phrase, like, if you don't laugh, you cry or, you know, um, but, you know, what are some of the different signs that we see and what might be the ones that we might be overlooking kind of like, you know, laughter? Um, that might be people trying to cope. Um, to whomever feels inclined to answer this, feel free to go ahead. <laughs> I, I can follow up real quickly. Um, some of the stuff that I've been looking at in the research is that um, a lot of things that people have done traditionally to um, um, blunt, you know, the, the stress and the trauma have been around movement. Movement is so important for people. And of course, if your movement is colonized, then, um, chances are the levels of anxiety and depression are going to be higher because a lot of research shows that uh, it builds this toxic level of uh, carerinine in the body and enzyme that leads to depression. Running, movement, dancing, and singing all help reduce the level of carerinine in the body and change it from a, a, a toxic level to one that's more neutral. This is why human beings have moved so much. This is why when you colonize somebody and you put them in one place and don't allow them to move, they're going to get sick. You know, especially people who have been on the land for such a long time that were used to moving. So you, you're looking at generations of uh, chil uh, children and people that come from that part of the world, from the Gaza. Their ancestors moved a lot. They moved and they migrated, you know, and of course that was something that we did as human beings. So that's clearly in our, um, in our genetics. We know now from some of the research that when people sing, let's say they sing, songs of praise or happy songs and they dance levels of endocannabinoids rise in the brain endocannabinoids are improve the mood they preserves the brain's function just like running does they lead to neurogenesis in the brain and also um, it helps you know uh, neurons from dying you know endocannabinoids improve mood they uh, blunt pain so all those things are really important to to think about how movement plays in and singing is, is one of the most powerful things that people can do. Prayer is the same thing, it's very powerful. You take away prayer, you take away singing, you colonize movement, you colonize dancing, and then you're gonna, people are gonna get sick. But all of our ancestors had those traditional practices. Most, we don't do that much in, in, in um, current Western mental health practice. That's really not part of um, our, in our toolbox to get people back to who they are as um, you know, uh, culturally. So, but we know from studies, all that stuff, you know, has a very, very powerful effect on, on the health of people, proves health. And uh, can you hear me? Is that good? Okay. So I think too that like, uh, you know, when you, you were asking like how, and I totally agree by the way with the movement, like it's amazing when you see children who are stressed, even if in like a, at home in a classroom setting in, in, in you know, and even so teachers are just like they just won't sit still and work and meanwhile this kid has experienced a lot of trauma or they're having a really hard time paying attention or and, and sometimes all it takes as you're working with the child to get to a good place is to just say okay you can stand at you can sit at a desk you know in in the back of the class if you want or off to the side and you can stand you can walk around your desk you can do something like that and we see that that has actually a tremendous impact on the ability for, of, for kids to just like focus and, and just kind of help with with reducing stress levels in stress in stressful situations. But I think when looking at um, cultural, like ethnic um, and racial minorities, we are looking at the, the biggest thing I see, especially working um, here is behavior. So like, you know, sometimes a lot of times children who have behavior outbursts, uh, especially in cultures where children are expected to be acting in a certain way, it, it's missed as like a mental health um, call, like cry for help. The other thing is we see a lot of somatic complaints. And then the other thing that we see is inattention. 
So they're having a really difficult time paying attention. They're having a difficult time focusing. I mean, there's, of course, the outward things like irritability and, and, and you know, like tearfulness and emotional and, and kids saying, I don't feel good and I'm scared and I'm sad. But um, I think especially with boys where it is where there are cultures where the, the the stigma towards mental health is so high i mean there's so much trauma in the arab world but there's still a very high stigma when it comes to mental health support and so I, those are the, the those are high complaints that i see um yeah so you both mentioned you know it's really stressed um that, that's fascinating by the way both of what you, you said but you both mentioned movement and you know, singing and, and, and dance as you know, coping uh, mechanisms. I know some of the UNRWA counselors, and we do actually have an UNRWA counselor, Shaher, who's tuned in from Gaza right now. Um, so hello, Shaher, thank you for joining us. I know it is very late where you are. Um, I know um, UNRWA counselors like him use art therapy and um, as, as a way to, to help children who have experienced now you know, four uh, Israeli military assaults by the time they're 14 years old um, to address some of the trauma that they have experienced. And um, Dr. Yellowberg, you mentioned that you know, some of these therapies are not within the traditional Western toolbox. So I was wondering, what is in uh, y'all's toolbox? Like what, what kind of therapy do you use to address um, this type of you know, intergenerational trauma, um, you know, PTSD, and some of the other traumas that you uh, mentioned during this conversation? Well, again, I can just start and say that um, I think um, a, a lot of folks that I've seen in, in North America, for instance, indigenous people are going back to land-based uh, education and therapies. It's, it's very much, um, you know, in, in the uh, DNA of folks. It's very much in, in the stories, in the memory that when people reconnect with the land, that's what's very important, you know, and we all know that land to us is holy or sacred. All of us, you know, believe that, you know, where we come from is a sacred place. And so we as indigenous people um, have a particular connection to the land because, it, you know, it, it houses and, and, and their rest are ancestors, their memories, their blood, uh, our children, you know, born from the, that soil. And so land um, that I see, uh, land-based education and therapy is happening for a long time with indigenous people in North America. And now have kind of come circle around again, circle around Western sort of approaches where you're in the office, you know, um, in one room talking about your pain and misery and, and um, all the bad stuff, which, you know, at some point has, 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 um, has some value. But I think with most indigenous cultures, um, I think people, you know, want to be outside in the sunshine. They want to sing, they want to dance, they want to be on the land. And I'm seeing more and more of that happening. I, I really encourage it. I really think it's it's a very brilliant kind of thing to go back to because it it, it gets beyond what, what I think we understand in terms of uh, helping the helping professions, you know, where we move from that kind of thinking into a more Western kind of way of, you know, um, individual therapy or psychodynamic, you know, thinking. Uh, when in fact, what we really needed was connecting people back to things that were meaningful to them. And so those kinds of things uh, really help provide a great deal of uh, like a really strong firewall emotionally against uh, trauma and against hardship. I mean, I mean, take it from indigenous people you know, around the world. They have endured climate change long before now. They endured, you know, um, um, tribal warfares. They endured different kinds of... Uh, uh, you know, earthquakes and famines and floods, all those kinds of things. And we're here because of that. We're here because of that, because they figured out ways how to flow with it, to move with it. So it was always understanding, you know, how, you know, things were flowing in, in the world, in nature. So I think that's that's one big piece of the toolbox. Amazing. Dr. Gazelle or Dr. Sadler, do you have any tools that you use? I, well, as Dr. Yellowbird was discussing, thinking about making meaning, it actually reminded me of in thinking about just trauma recovery in general, that um, complex trauma and experiencing stress can really ha have an impact on 
one's own self-concept, even kind of future orientation and thinking about what's possible, um, that it can be quite easy to fall into feelings of hopelessness or helplessness if, if it feels like your efforts have no positive outcome, that you don't have the ability to impact change and impart change, um, whether it's on your own self or your circumstances. And so the even the idea of just trying to find meaning, I think, will be and something that comes up quite often um, just by a sheer motivation. Um, because I know for a lot of families where there's a lot of community-based strife, truly strife, that it can be hard to find purpose and and going through the efforts of change um, or attempting to tolerate or um, make movement even. And so that was one thing that came to mind in general. Um, but in thinking about trauma work, I know we discussed play or play came up um, somewhere. I did see it in the comments as well. And as I think about young children, um, play is truly the language of the young child. And so we may not get a lot out in words, but you can certainly get a lot out in, in their own special language. And so I think finding ways to just really meet children where they are in many cases. And if that is on the ground somewhere, um, grabbing what we can to find ways of assisting them in processing a lot of what's happening around them, trying to re reinstill kind of this assurance that things are moving, things are changing, that if possible, that safety is in place, that the adults around us are creating a space that will be safe, even if it's a tiny space, not necessarily a full community or a full community and not necessarily a full world. Um, but trying to find ways of being able to just kind of instill that so that we can get back to a place of hope and get back to a place of getting that momentum um, to continue moving forward. Yeah, something we hear oftentimes from, you know, testimonies from children in, in the Gaza Strip is that they've lost a sense of hope or, you know, feel helpless. And, you know, parents are saying this as well, because, you know, as, as, as a parent, you want to keep your child safe and, um, specifically in Gaza, and then also we're seeing in, in, in the West Bank, you see Syria, you know, Palestine refugees in, in, in general, um, you know, parents aren't able to protect their children from, you know, the bombings, and whether that's in the Gaza Strip or in Syria, or whether it's from home demolitions or evictions in the West Bank. And um, yeah, it, 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 it puts the onus in this tremendous task on, you know, mental health professionals like yourselves to try to rebuild that, that, sense, of, that sense of hope. Um, Dr. El Ghazal, what have, what have you seen in your work in, in, in Doha? I'm sure there's a lot of migrant populations and, and, and that, that feeling of potential hopelessness or um, inability to return to their home or you know, other traumas that you've, you've witnessed. You know, I just want to, I just, I really want to talk about this idea of hope because I think it really is such a foundational part of whatever whatever mental health issue you're facing in the moment like trauma for sure right but then also this idea everybody who comes to my office is coming because there's they are tired of being where they are and when you're a teenager it's often because your parents have brought you or a child your parents have brought you and and you don't really know if things are going to look different can they look different your perspective is very much focused on what you're experiencing right now and and, and you know children very much want to be they, they don't want to they don't they don't want to be different they want to be like other kids and so like i can't tell you how many times i hear that like i feel this way but nobody else feels this way and so i think um and, and this is the kind of stuff that really makes them feel defeated and when you feel defeated you feel that, that feeling defeated feeling resigned and, and hopelessness comes with that and i think um the, the biggest thing that i think of the foundation of um, what we do is really giving a sense of hope for like the way that you're, this is making sense of why you feel the way that you feel. You aren't, you aren't alone. Your experiences are unique to you, but you're not alone in, in this because especially when it's a collective, you know, even if it's within a family or, or their siblings or other friends who are similar to them who have also migrated, you know, and then in a broader sense, their larger community. Um, so I just find that the, the really honing in on this idea of hope is truly where they when when they start to see that is when they start to really turn the corner. Um, I, I at least for me, like the light bulb sort of goes on. The because if you're defeated and you're feeling hopeless, you it's hard for you to want to engage. And so often to, to pull kids in, like Dr. Sadler was saying, play, um, movement, like we were saying earlier. But also sometimes kids just need a space to just be. 
And, and you know, with, with teenagers, you're not quite sure how they want to, you know, like, especially that sort of middle school age, you know, they, they come in and they're just like straight out of elementary school. And then they, by eighth grade, they're going into high school. And that's that jump is big. And you're not quite sure where they fit. So just offering them a space to be where they do feel safe. Uh, if they, you can color, you want to color, you want to listen to music, listen to music, you want to just sit there with quiet, without an adult badgering you, you can sit there, I will talk to you for a little bit, you know? And so offering them that space um, and then instilling a sense of hope and then the work really starts. Yeah, that's uh, highly relatable. I feel like sometimes I just need my own space. So I feel like that's not unique to, to children or maybe I'm just a big child as well. But um, but yeah, I some of the things that you were, you were saying, um, made me think of you know how again we've we've all experienced um, some form of, of trauma this year with COVID-19 and or, or, or know someone in distress or um, someone who has faced depression anxiety etc um, and I was wondering what we can do if we're not mental health experts like you all how can we how can we support each other how can we give each other hope um, or uplift each other um, and yeah so if, if y'all can speak to that I'll say, and thinking about one instilling hope that um, part of hope also, what also comes into play is finding oneself value, like having value in oneself, um, having one's own self-worth. And I know when stressors occur, um, especially with depression, that that, that sense of self-worth can slide just a little bit. We may start to lose it just a bit. Um, and so when, thinking about how to support both ourselves and um, maybe our friends, family, just others out in the community. Um, I think one big piece of that is making sure that those individuals understand that they do matter and that they do have worth and that there are um, individuals who do care about them, that we may not necessarily be able to give all the comedic jokes to lighten the mood, but maybe we can assist with just general healthy lifestyles that maybe it's having a walking buddy, um, someone to get us out of the house when we can and when we feel comfortable to do so. Um, perhaps it's thinking about just checking in on eating or sleeping. Um, do you have an appetite today? Do I need to make you some food today? Um, separate from more of our social emotional side where if we do need friends to assist us in when we are feeling more nervous or upset, down or blue. Um, but one thing that I often think about is creating kind of um one's own kind of truly outlining your support network. And so when I need this, this is the option available to me, whether it's a person, a place, an activity, um, a conversation, but having your own kind of game plan for oneself, but then also allowing yourself to be um, open to receiving support from others just the same. Um, I know that's a little bit all over the place, but <laughs> in thinking about just really kind of game planning when I am not feeling great, what are the things that I one need to do? So I need to eat, I need to sleep, I need to rest, um, and perhaps I need to get moving. And if I'm not able to do that on my own, who are my support people? Who are my who are my networks really that will help me to do that? Um, whether it is a pastor or a religious. Um, Kind of leader, a friend, family member, therapist, um, whoever it may be. So I'll get us started there. I want to say, like, I have found uh, on social media, like, COVID has been really, really hard, right? COVID has brought with it so much uncertainty. And we know uncertainty is it's not really good. It's, it's not, we, people don't do well with uncertainty. And then add to it the isolation that came, that's not good for people, you know? And so, like, COVID has brought with it so many things that really we know tend to make fe people feel anxious or sad or, or feel isolated or feel lonely. But what the other thing I've seen come from COVID is the discussions surrounding mental health and the normalization of those discussions on social media outlets has been tremendous. I mean, you have to be careful what you consume on social media when it comes to mental health and really anything. Like, you know, we all get on Google searches searches for like, I have a pain in my jaw. What is happening? Next thing you know, you're like, oh my gosh, you're in an ambulance because you, you know, you panicked that you read something. But um, in general, there has been an outpour of people checking on people, talking about it. It's okay not to be okay. Um, even things like don't say this, say this to support your friend. This feels invalidating. Like I've been seeing a lot of that stuff circulating, circulating and some of it is actually quite good in that it gives you a little bit of, of um, 
it gives you a little bit of, of tools, some, some tools that you can use. Uh, but the other thing I will say is that if you're worried about your friend, reach out and encourage them to reach out, you know? And I think normalizing that process as well to say, why don't we go to somebody? I mean, the mental health demand has increased worldwide, you know? And so many different places are offering like, you know, like as part of the COVID relief, like mental health support, because this is a time where it's been so stressful more than any, more than any other time. I've seen people say, call this hotline, do this. And, and people are really actively engaging in that. And so I think providing that support and also so that conversation about like how are you doing what's going on you're not feeling okay let's go for a walk give them space to be not okay you know and then normalizing asking for help there's no better time than now to do that because it is already out there it's so tangible and it's totally understandable and i think when we look at the context of covid i can't tell you how many people have sort of relaxed when they're like talking about feeling stressed, especially parents, because there's guilt there, like, I can't keep it together. And I'll say something, Matt, like, come on, COVID has been hard for so many people. And immediately, it's almost like a barrier comes down, like, oh, you too, you know what I mean? Or somebody else as well, you know? And I think this is a really opportune time. And COVID's brought so much negativity, but this is something that I think we can capitalize and hopefully move forward with. There's been a lot of focus on, from the school side, children's mental health as opposed to where they are academically. And that's also been a really positive switch. That's fantastic to hear, you know, the silver lining behind something that's been, you know, really hard year for, for so many. Um, I am looking in uh, the comment section from some people uh, who commented and Anne-Marie uh, asked a question um, that I'd like to feel to you all. Um, uh, if we can discuss how to help children deal with the reality of living under occupation, um, you know, there's there's uh, occupation, um, there's the blockade, there's the discussion that we had as well, a little bit about that neuro decolonization as well, but um, you spoke about Dr. Uh, Yellowbird. Um, so, you know, how can we support them? Um, we also, you know, have, there's, UNRWA provides, you know, mental health services, um, you know, through play, through, um, through, you know, your mental health counselors and um, some of those programs that you mentioned, but beyond that, what is possible? What would you all suggest? So um, I can I, I can suggest something that I think is has got a lot of really strong evidence base behind it, and um, it's it's a mindfulness meditation. Um, and you know it's it's really interesting to see what's happening during the era of COVID. Why there's so much anxiety and so much you know fear and all these kinds of things. Uh, for me, that was. That was really a clear indicator that you know um, we as humans really lack cognitive flexibility to begin with, right? We're distracted very easily, um, and and that's that's a, a you know what I call a compromised executive you know function in the brain. You know, you, you know your ability to pay attention, to avoid distraction, and um, and to avoid you know uh, desire and, and temptation, but also to move from one task to the next to be able to healthily compartmentalize what you're doing rather than letting thoughts ruminate, right? And we all do that. So it takes a lot of training to do that, right? And, and that's where I think um, cultures have been doing that forever, contemplative, you know, and children can do it. We, we've seen, I've seen research, where the research has been published for kids as young as two year old. Uh, my, my daughter's two year old daughters and my daughters still do mindfulness in, in their little kids. I've got older sons and I've got little daughters. And uh, they've been doing mindfulness for years. I, I myself have been practicing for over 45 years. But I call it also neurodecolonization because it's not just sitting there, you know, um, you know, doing mindfulness practices like Western, like Western mindfulness is, but it's also understanding, you know, how the mind is conscripted, you know, from, you know, by colonization and, and, uh, and then it creates all these fears. One of the things that mindfulness does is help to uh, begin to restore a sense of well-being. I mean, our, our brains evolve to be contemplative. That's really important to remember, and kids can do it. I've taught, I've taught uh, kids on Indian reservations, little kids at uh, tribal schools. I've taught kids at, at uh, tribal uh, kids at charter schools, um, and they, it all comes back, you know. And these a lot of these kids are, you know, had parents, uh, you know, who are absent or. or they were homeless, had all these things going against them, um, but they picked it up really quickly. 
And it was a, it was another kind of firewall psychologically and emotionally and spiritually for them, right? Because you know you mentioned hope. I use the word optimism, right? Optimism it gives them you know chance, right? There's 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 optimism like okay the world has been going on like this for a long time, but I understand it, and it teaches kids how to pay attention to their thinking. You know, their thoughts, you are not your thoughts, but your thoughts come and go, situations come and go. And that's the whole idea for a lot of indigenous people that you know, Buddhists call impermanence, but we have the same concept, most people, that we're not gonna live forever, you know? And that's clear. So we understand how to stay in the moment, and compartmentalize, but it takes training to do that. And it, it takes guidance to do that. And that's why I think we're finding out one of the most powerful kinds of uh, approaches people are kind of all catching on to now, which is really, really sort of old, you know, it's thousands of years old meditation, is now it's become just like, you know, all over the place. But it really works. And and we know if historically, you know, from all the texts and all the writings and all the people that have done it to the current brand new Western science that's catching on to say, oh yeah, I guess this works, right? And you can get big grants for doing this stuff. But, you know, it's really, I think it's really important to think about Take care of the, the brains of the children. Take care of the brains of the children. It'll take care of the spirit, the heart, the emotions. And, you know, in, a, in, in some ways, I won't, I won't use the word bulletproof, but it, what it does is it's a protective. It's a strong protective factor for them. And so if people were interested in doing that, it's easy to do, easy to implement. It's, um, and, and it doesn't cost anything. It's culturally very neutral when you're just training the person how to pay attention to their thoughts and let go of their thoughts. And remain in a positive state, and um, it works. Right, thousands. There's tens of thousands of years of evidence base for it. So we evolved to do that. We've got the hardware in the brain to do all these things. It affects, you know, really important parts of the brain, like the insula or the pre, um, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, where cognitive resilience lives. That's where cognitive resilience lives in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, kind of under the eyes. There's that's that center of really power for kids. We can give that to them, right? It doesn't have to be related to anything spiritual or religious, but it can be just training them, you know, to kind of engage their thinking, to engage their um, their minds and to use, you know, the mind is the ally, right? To use, it's one of the most powerful allies, so. You perfectly answered actually a question that just came in um, about how to bring, build resiliency in, in, in communities like Gaza where there's occupation, ethnic cleansing, and apartheid um, occurring, said Lulu. Um, so yeah, it's, um, uh, it, it's, um, it, it's, it's interesting to, to hear. It's, it's just really that building up that, that resiliency and, and, and these old practices that um, people have had across, um, you know, across many different uh, groups for, for years and years. Um, so uh, I, I, I didn't, I, I don't want to cut off anyone else. If anyone, if Dr. Sadler or Dr. Al-Ghazal, if you want to add um, to how to build resiliency or, um, you know, other, other practices that you, you suggest. I'll just add because I'll just say I concur across the board. <laughs> In many ways, I'll say it's almost kind of a, a giving back of things that might have been taken away just based on the occupancy itself. So when thinking about the prefrontal cortex, but in addition to that, um, knowing that community can be such a stronghold that as best as we can in any way that we can continue to um, preserve a sense of community as best as possible. So that isn't necessarily a mental health tactic by any means, um, but something that can certainly be a, a tiny bit more restorative, um, if at all possible, to um, ensure that families are feeling like they still, again, have something to hold on to. Um, I know I'd mentioned hope before, but in thinking about that once we get to a space of, of just feeling entirely powerless and knowing that power is very limited, that it can make it really difficult to continue to move forward uh, and to build that resiliency and allow ourselves and lean into um, the resiliency building kind of component. So that's my only addition that I'll include in there. And I just want to add that I 100% like agree with or the, the discussion um, around mindfulness, because really it, it, it truly is amazingly powerful. And resilience 
just like mindfulness is a skill. And so what I encourage a lot of times children to do is if you can build resilience with small things, um, you know, because a lot of times people will expect to be resilient with some huge thing that comes their way and they're not sure what to do. And the thing is, is the, the biggest thing I can say is if you can build resilience with the very, very small things, one, it builds confidence, two, it's a sense of empowerment, three, it's a sense of control. And those are the things that kids don't have when they live in those kinds of environments. Um, and to be able to protect your mind, I love that protect your mind, protect protect children's minds, their hearts, their souls, their spirits, that was so powerful. And I think, you know, in, in doing that, and then you build them up as well um, by, by teaching resilience. Resilience is something that all of us can access. And so I think teaching those two skills together in, in the small moments of every day really prepares children. uplifting note to to hear after you know so kind of a listing of so many of the traumas that uh you know people are facing um to know that there is there are solutions and um you know just kind of as a, as a final note i was wondering you know how can we be better allies you know i um you know we were thinking about people um you know black brown indigenous people who are facing more mental health problems just by virtue of living in their bodies. And um, and I'm, I'm curious how we can be allies for each other through our work and how can we, you know, we've shared that, you know, people can register for the Gaza 5K as a small act of, you know, showing uh, you know, solidarity with Palestinian people and Palestinian refugees specifically in Gaza, but how can we support your work um, for the people that you, um, that you support? Uh, I'm sure people would be interested in hearing that. I think one of the things that I, I've seen recently um, in, in my lifetime, I, I was kind of a child at the end of the Vietnam War but a lot of things were happening, you know, with uh, the Black Panthers and the American Indian Movement and activist groups were doing a lot of stuff. And I got to know people from, from that time who, who have remained activists throughout their lives. And then I saw different things happening in North America where groups arise, like uh, missing and murdered indigenous women groups would arise and Idle No More would rise. These are indigenous um, inspired groups. And then I finally, 2016, I saw uh, the culmination of a lot of this stuff where people from all over the world came to Standing Rock. And, uh, you know, a lot of people from around the world came there. Palestinian people came there. There was a Palestinian flag there. You know, people came. And, and I, I think that's what people need to do is to, you know, to support one another in that way, to be there, to witness, to participate, you know, to be active. And... Um, and now today, I, 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 you know, I see that happening after the, um, the the murder of George Floyd. People, you know, policies, you know, laws, those kinds of things. Let's be honest; those are those are you know created by the the one percent, the wealthy, and and they're not meant for the average person. They're not meant for the poor. They're not for, meant for the marginalized. They're, they're constructed to keep the marginalized and the poor under control. That's reality. And people have been fighting against that forever. But we know now today that when people got out into the street and they, you know, showed their um, righteous anger and rage, they began to change the complexion, this racist complexion of, of uh, American society. Racist statues started to come down, racist uh, uh, Confederate generals racist names like the Washington Redskins and the, and the, um, and the uh, Cleveland Indians, those, uh, all those really uh, racist uh, uh, mascots, racist names of uh, uh, slave owners were coming off of colleges and buildings. And everybody, everybody you know, not everybody, but many people know that's wrong, but they, they just could not have the courage or the conviction to do it. So it took people to get out into the streets to do it. Activism works, activism works. So we have to remember that, you know, it's, it, you know, when we think we're doing activism and we're not going beyond the line that says you can't cross this line for justice, then we know why we're being held there. So, so justice, because justice cannot prevail. 
And that's the important thing to remember. It can prevail when people come together. And it always has come, you know, when people come together. And hopefully that's what's happening right now um, with uh, in the Middle East, you know, with with uh, with the pressure that is happening now with uh, the American government. Part of that is because, and, I, and I, I honestly believe this, is that there have been a number of young women of color that have joined the Congress. Right? They're they're resculpting the way that politics works. They're bringing the the, the face of color and the face of of you know reality to to that body politic that's always been so old and white and male. Right? That's what works. People has to get get involved at a level so they can change those things. So I'll say that. I've reached out to some friends of mine who live in Palestine right now. And I've said, like, how can we help? You know, like, what do you guys need right now? You know, um, and the biggest thing that I heard back was just like we appreciate the solidarity they're noticing and people are noticing that the voices are rising all over the world i mean and i think and just people coming out coming together and then speaking up for this um and not being like bashful or shy to read to talk about like the straight facts that are happening you know and and so people who are in palestine when i said like how can we help like nobody said we need you know food, we need this, we need this aid. Everybody just said, we appreciate the solidarity. We, we want the voices to keep going. Yes, I'm thinking and hearing you both speak as well. Um, actually, what comes to mind, because it always feels like an overwhelming task to think about structural change separate from institutional change, separate from individual change. Um, and what I find most grounding sometimes is actually just thinking about truly the stages of change. So the, the five tiered system, kind of knowing that at any given time as individuals, as institutions, as a society, that we may be at different stages of change, um, whether that's our pre-contemplation where there is no problem, we're blind to it entirely, um, versus contemplation where we are noticing that perhaps there is something going on um, and getting into our preparation stage where we are, you know, we've decided we do want change and now we need to actually figure out what our action steps look like and then moving into action and then maintenance from there. Um, and so when I think all the way back to allyship or and thinking about how we can support one another, um, I go both down to my own personal level. And so what can I do? Where am I? Where do I sit in my own stage of change? And then where do those around me sit in their own stage of change? And how can we use our own state? So whether we're in a place place where we're able to be more active um, and show that support and be in solidarity, that, that maybe that our role then is to assist our fellows, uh, our fellow, not necessarily friends, but kind of community members who may be more in a pre-contemplation where they are not necessarily aware. And that in and of itself is just enough push potentially to get us to a place where they can move into contemplation, just considering that perhaps there is change that must happen. Um, or if we're in a position where we're able to make actual, we're able to make strides ahead, um, that actually taking the action and making sure that we are also planning for um, possible um, disruptions to that. So how do we plan ahead for, we get two steps ahead, but we're knocked back three steps. Um, how do we truly keep that into the plans itself? And I, even when I think both like just more structurally for the our US government. Um, and just like you said, Dr. Yellowbird, it's been very old and very white for a very long time. And in many ways, I think the government in and of itself um, is in a very pre-contemplative state in many ways and maybe potential contemplation in other ways. Um, and so if we're able to kind of keep our own activism going and making sure that those voices are uplifted and that information facts are out in the world and that we are challenging what those norms look like um, and what the expectations are that we'll be able to get to a place where if we're not able to shift the powers that be to, from a state of pre-contemplation to contemplation to action that will just remove them and then get folks into place and into places of power where they are ready for action um, but I also understand that the system is built so that we're not able to do that. And so <laughs> it is its own special work in progress. But I'll add that in there too. Uh, thank you so much. Um, 
Wow, I, I feel like I've, I've learned so much and I wanted to thank you all three. Um, you know, we've hit about an hour and I just wanted to thank you three for sharing your work and expertise with us. Um, and you know, also sharing just so many ways that we can be supportive to each other, to supportive to um, you know, different communities. And I'd also just like to take a final moment to you know, remind those who are watching, um, who wish to take an action to support Palestine refugee mental health, you can do so through UNRWA USA's virtual Gaza 5K and digital festival. It's accessible to all and all funds raised um, support urgent assistance for refugees in Gaza, including mental health, which we've discussed you know, in large part today. And um, for people who are tuning in right now, you can use the code mental health, one word for a $5 discount. Um, so yes, thank you to everyone who tuned in, everyone who asked so many questions, and especially thank you so much um, to our wonderful panelists. Um, it, was, uh, it was just wonderful to hear and learn um, from, from you all. And uh, thank you for taking your time to share share your wisdom with us and support the collective well-being of you know, all of our communities. Um, so I hope to connect with you all soon in the future. And thank you again for, for being here. Really appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs>